By the year 2050, it's estimated that global food production will need to increase by around 70% in developed countries to keep up with current consumption trends. Although only 29% of the Earth's surface consists of land, where only 71% of which can be used for agriculture. But the most worrying part is that we already use 50% of that land for agriculture. So to increase food production using traditional farming methods, we would have to destroy our forests and convert them into farmland. But the thing is, we need those forests, along with many other measures, to be able to suck up carbon from the atmosphere and stop global warming. But the problem is, we still need to feed the Earth's ever-increasing population of humans. So how are we going to do that without deforestation and more farmland? Well, I might have found a solution to this, but to explain it, we need to go vertical. Also, only a small percentage of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed. So if you end up liking this video, consider subscribing, it's free, and you can always change your mind. Vertical farms have been growing in popularity in recent times as more and more companies have popped up out of nowhere and got an insane amount of funding to make these vertical farms. One example of this could be Aero Farms that has received almost a quarter of a billion dollars in funding so far. So what is all the hype about? Are these farms the future? Well, vertical farming is a really promising concept as it can provide you with microgreens like baby spinach, basil and many others up to around 15 times annually as it can be grown all year round inside these temperature controlled vertical farms that use LEDs instead of sunlight. Other upsides include no water waste, no harmful chemicals, pesticides and no dirt is required as everything is carefully monitored and under control. But possibly the biggest advantage for a vertical farm is in its name as it enables you to grow crops horizontally as well as vertically, which is obviously not the case in traditional farming methods. Although, as with anything in life, there are downsides to this as well, and these downsides are actually pretty significant. First is the cost to build one of these farms, which is obviously significantly higher than just buying a field and turning it into a lettuce farm. The exact costs are unknown and vary drastically from farm to farm, but Cambridge HOK made an estimate for a level 3 vertical farm which is fully autonomous to be between $2,000 and $2,700 per square meter, which is obviously a lot more than just buying a patch of land and start farming. But you'll have to remember that you can produce around 100 times as much in a vertical farm as you can on a traditional farm. So you'll need 100 times more farmland to produce the same amount of crops. But still, the vertical farm would never become anywhere near as profitable as a traditional farm if it shared the same expenses. But as you might have guessed by now, costs to operate a vertical farm are much lower than a traditional one. Imagine having a farm where you can harvest it 15 times a year and where none of those harvests can fail, where you don't have to spend any money on fertilizers or pesticides, where you don't have any wasted water and where the whole farm can be automated and scaled infinitely. That is what a vertical farm offers. And over the long run, a vertical farm could actually make more sense financially than a traditional farm. Although vertical farms do make more sense in some specific markets. A good example of this is Saudi Arabia, where historically virtually all produce had to be imported from countries far away as the Saudi Arabian climate didn't allow them to farm anything cost effectively if they used traditional farming methods. But their major disadvantage in traditional farming becomes their significant advantage in vertical farming, as they can harvest electricity from from the sun using solar panels to power these vertical farms which completely eliminates their electricity bill that is usually the main cost to operate one of these farms. This is the reason why Saudi Arabia has invested heavily in vertical farms and why Emirates Airlines gets plenty of its greens from vertical farms in Saudi Arabia. But vertical farms make sense in many other countries and regions as well. Basically any country or region where traditional farming methods aren't viable it's a great solution. The only problem with vertical farms is that you can't really grow cereals or any type of grain as it will be massively inefficient to do so. With those crops, it will always be cheaper to just import them from another country rather than building a vertical farm to grow them domestically. And that's a problem because most of the land we use for agricultural purposes are used to farm cereals, coarse grain and oil crops, which means that vertical farms, at least in its current state won't really make a difference in the land used for agricultural purposes worldwide. So we won't be getting rid of this farmland anytime soon and therefore we can't replant our forests on the scale we need to to combat climate change. 
So why is it that the next generation of farming is vertical if it won't help us fight climate change and can't produce all the necessary crops? Well, this is where it starts to get really interesting. You see, there is something called three-dimensional underwater farming that could replace forests as well as a big chunk of our agricultural land. Which sounds great, so what is three-dimensional underwater farming? Well, it's a way to farm wheat, but it's not the wheat you are familiar with that we grow on land. No, it's seaweed. And seaweed farming is actually pretty remarkable in the sense that it can be used for many different things, including food for our population, biofuel for long-haul planes and container ships, as well as fertilizer. But possibly the most exciting thing about seaweed is that the overall effect of seaweeds on the global ecosystem is already enormous. It is estimated that all algae are jointly responsible for producing 90% of the oxygen in the atmosphere and up to 80% of the organic matter on Earth. We can compare their output with plants on land by looking at the amount of organic carbon generated per square meter on an annual basis. Macroalgae can produce between 2 and 14 kilograms, whereas terrestrial plants such as trees and microalgae can generate only about 1 kilogram. This means that the best thing we can possibly do to our planet and climate change is growing more seaweed. But that's only part of it, as we also need to use that seaweed for something, because we can't just produce a bunch of seaweed and leave it in the ocean. So, as I previously mentioned, we will have to use it for a bunch of different things if we are to produce it at a scale that will have a significant impact on our planet. So, let's discuss the many ways we can use seaweed. And I promise you, you will be surprised at how many things this stuff can be used for, other than just your sushi roll. Alright, so the best way to use seaweed from an environmental perspective is to eat it. And luckily, seaweed has a bunch of health benefits. You see, seaweeds are made up of a special combination of substances, which are very different from the ones typically found in land-based plants, which allows them to play a distinctive role in human nutrition. Most notably, the mineral content of seaweed is 10 times greater than what is found in plants grown in soil. But what is even more interesting is that the composition of dried seaweed is 45 to 75 percent carbohydrates, 7 to 35 percent proteins, less than 5 percent fats, and as previously mentioned, a large number of different minerals and vitamins. So it's fair to say that seaweed could very easily become a large part of our diet, considering all the health benefits it provides. But what about all this biofuel stuff? Well, if you didn't know, we need a sustainable solution for our fossil fuel driven vehicles. And while we do have batteries that work brilliantly in cars, they don't make much sense in something like a long haul aircraft or container ship, at least as of right now. So we've been trying to figure out what technology or sustainable fuel source that could complement battery electric vehicles. But biofuels have never really been an option, as most biofuel produced today is made from corn which is a major bottleneck, considering the more biofuel you need, the more corn you have to farm, and at some point, we won't have enough land left for both fuel and food production. Although sure, you could chop down forests and gain some extra farmland from that, but I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that is a bad idea. So for these reasons, biofuels have never really been a viable option, until now. You see, seaweed can actually be turned into a biofuel as well, and even though we are still in the early stages of development, the potential could be huge. Researchers in Denmark were the first to test a seaweed-based biofuel, and they found no difference in performance in a regular vehicle that was driving with a seaweed-based biofuel blend compared to normal fuel. Now sure, they only had 10% of the tank filled with this seaweed-based biofuel, but you'll have to remember that this technology is in its infancy, and it's rapidly improving. So it's not really a question if it will happen, but more so when it will happen. So one day we should see the first vehicles run on seaweed-based biofuel. Although food and fuel is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what we can use seaweed for. Other implications include medicine, cosmetics, fertilizers, and so on. So it seems we won't have a problem when it comes to utilizing seaweed. But what about farming seaweed? Well, the best thing about seaweed is that it can be farmed by anyone, anywhere, for a low cost. You see, you only need $20,000 and 20 acres of water to get started as a seaweed farmer. And while farming seaweed, you can actually also farm mussels as well as oysters in the same area to maximize revenue. What you will end up with is what I previously mentioned, a three-dimensional underwater farm where seaweed is grown on lines near the surface, mussels are grown vertically and oysters are grown at the bottom. And you don't even need to feed anything in this farm. 
as the seaweed feeds off of the sun and the shellfish feed off of the plankton floating around in the waters. It's basically a no maintenance farm that is easy to start while still being great for the environment. So at this point, we are basically only waiting for the world to realize the potential that lies in seaweed farming as it is obvious it has great implications in the future we are building. Also, I created a Patreon, so if you want to support the channel directly, go to the link in the description and sign up today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.